Welcome back everybody to the third episode in the OpenStars video series. Uh, this is a series on basic stellar astronomy and astrophysics based on doing demonstrations and experiments with the Star 3 virtual star simulator. At the end of our last episode, episode 2, uh, you might remember that we were left with a mystery. Uh, in episode 2 we did a series of Gray Star 3 experiments where we adjusted the mass of the star that we were simulating while leaving everything else as it is for the Sun. And we saw that even if we turned the mass of the star up to a fairly high value, up to five solar masses, the largest star that we were able to simulate only had a radius of about two solar radii or so. On the other hand, uh, we saw last time that when astronomers go out and use eclipsing binary star systems to measure the radii of stars, they have found stars with radii as large as 10 solar radii, all the way up to 100 solar radii. These are the giant stars. Yet we were not able to simulate stars anywhere near that big last time when we turned up the star's mass. And so the mystery is, how do we go about simulating giant stars? And uh, we are going to solve that mystery in today's episode, and doing so is going to lead us to yet another basic stellar property, namely a star's surface gravity. Um, and we're going to see today that a star's surface gravity is closely related to the two properties we talked about last time, namely mass and radius. In episode two, we spent quite a bit of time talking about a star's mass and, and the fact that mass is closely associated with the force of gravity. So I'm just going to go to a Wikipedia page here on gravity and I'm going to uh, scroll down here a little bit. So any object that has a mass, including planets like this one, and including stars, will be surrounded by its own gravitational force field. That is to say that that object will pull with the force of gravity on any other objects with mass that are nearby, including any test masses that we introduce into the vicinity of this primary object of interest. In fact, you might remember from episode two that one of the more profound definitions of mass in physics is that an object's mass is a measure of the strength of its gravitational force field. Now an important thing to appreciate is that the strength of an object's gravitational force field decreases with increasing distance from the center of that object. In fact, it decreases as the square of the distance from the center of the primary object. In fact, our gravity uh, is an example of what's known as an inverse square law. So uh, if we start off, say, by placing a test mass, and let's say that the cursor represents our test mass. So the cursor is showing up here um, as a little white circle with a black plus sign in the middle of it. Let's say that's our test mass, and so let's place it right here at a certain distance from the center of our primary object. Uh, and if it experiences a certain gravitational pull towards the center of the primary object at that distance, if we were to double the distance, that this test mass has from the center of the primary object, then the strength of that gravitational pull would not go down by a factor of two, it would go down by a factor of four. It would be one quarter what it was at the original distance. Okay, we've doubled the distance, two times two is four, so the force of gravity would go down to one quarter of what it was before. And if we were to move this test mass even further away so that it's three times the original distance, from the center of the primary object, then the force of gravity would go down to one-ninth what it was at the initial distance over here. Okay, three times three is nine. Okay, so gravity is an inverse square law. The strength of this primary object's gravitational force field decreases, this, uh, decreases as the square of the distance from the center of that object. So, uh, that raises an ambiguity. If we want to express the strength of this primary object's gravitational force field, at what distance should we measure it from the center of that object? And the rule is 
that we will express the strength of this object's gravitational force field at the surface of that object itself. That is at a distance equal to the object's radius. That puts us at the object's own surface and that is where we will measure and express the object's gravitational force field strength. So that quantity, uh, the strength of the, of the object's gravitational force field at its own surface, one radius from the center of that object, is what's known as the surface gravity. So surface gravity is a nice self-explanatory term. Now the other thing to uh, recognize in order to appreciate how the Star 3 input controls are labeled is that in physics and astronomy the universal symbol for surface gravity is the lowercase letter g. Okay, so I'll just highlight that here. Uh, the letter g of course stands for gravity but a lowercase g always in particular means surface gravity. Now let's recall an important idea from episode one in this series. Episode one was the episode where we introduced effective temperature, our first basic stellar property. But an important idea in that episode was the idea that stars do have an effective surface. So even though stars are gaseous all the way through, all the way down to the center, they are not transparent, they are opaque. And so from the point of view of an outside observer, gaseous stars do appear to have an effective surface, even though it's not a real solid or liquid surface. And we can certainly measure and express the strength of the star's gravitational force field at this apparent effective surface. And so in that way we can define a surface gravity for stars. The next thing to think about is how to express an object's surface gravity, little g. Or in other words, what are the units that we can use for the surface gravity, little g? Now that might seem like sort of an abstract thing to have to think about, uh, but it turns out that there is a very elegant trick that we can use to express an object's surface gravity, and that is to think about it in terms of what it is that gravity does. And what gravity does is it makes things fall. So let me go back to the Wikipedia page on gravity here and uh, scroll down a little bit further. So if we are standing on the surface of an object, a planet, that has mass and that therefore has a surface gravity, like let, let's say the Earth, and we let go of an object that we're holding, that object will fall. That is, it will move downwards towards the center of the primary object, the Earth in this case. If we ignore air resistance, then a falling object does not move downwards at constant speed. Rather, it accelerates downwards. That is, it picks up speed. Its speed increases uh, with each unit of time that passes. The magnitude of a falling object's acceleration is proportional to the surface gravity of the primary object whose surface we're standing on. So the greater the surface gravity of the primary object, of the planet Earth in this case, the greater the magnitude of the acceleration of a falling object. And so that means that we can use the acceleration of falling bodies near the primary object's surface uh, to express that primary object's surface gravity. And that also tells us what the units of surface gravity are that we can use. We can use the units of acceleration, the acceleration of a falling body downwards. And in the metric system, the units of acceleration are meters per second of speed increase per second of time. So that's meters per second per second which we can express more compactly as meters per second squared. So let's get a little bit of practice thinking about this idea. Any object with mass, including the planet Earth, has a surface gravity. Here on Earth, it just so happens that the value of the surface gravity is very close to a nice round number, namely 10 meters per second squared. 
So what does that mean? Well, let's say that we were to do an experiment with gravity here near the surface of the Earth. So the experiment that we're going to do is we're going to go to the top of this historically famous tower in Italy, uh, the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and let's say we were to drop a test mass. Let's say a grapefruit. Everybody's favorite test mass for doing experiments with gravity. You get a nice spectacular result when it hits the ground. Of course, by the way, uh, this is the tower where Galileo famously first demonstrated that falling objects accelerate as they move downward. So in our experiment, we're going to ignore the effect of air resistance on the falling object. So at the very beginning of our experiment, when the elapsed time is t is 0 seconds, we have not yet quite let go of the grapefruit. So it's not quite falling yet. And so its speed relative to the center of the primary object, the planet Earth, is still 0 meters per second. Now at elapsed time t equal to 1 second into the object, 1 second after we let go and the grapefruit has been falling, its speed will have increased from 0 to 10 meters per second. Two seconds after we start the experiment, its speed will have increased to 20 meters per second. Three seconds after we began, its speed will be at 30 meters per second. So for every second of time that goes by while it's still falling, it picks up an additional 10 meters per second of speed. And that's what it means to say that the Earth's surface gravity is 10 meters per second squared. And so that's how we use the units of acceleration of a falling body to express an object's surface gravity. Now I'm just going to introduce a couple of change-ups so that we can talk about this more in the way that astronomers do. And the first change-up I'm going to introduce has to do with the units. In astronomy, when we talk about surface gravity, we prefer to use the centimeter as our unit of distance rather than the meter. Uh, but that's okay. There are 100 centimeters in a meter. So if we take the Earth's surface gravity of 10 meters per second and multiply it by 100 centimeters per meter, then we get a surface gravity for the Earth of 1,000 centimeters per second squared. So in these units, uh, in our grapefruit experiment, uh, one second after we let the thing drop, it will be moving downwards at 1,000 centimeters per second. Two seconds after that, it's moving downward at 2,000 centimeters per second, and so on, picking up an additional 1,000 centimeters per second of speed for each second that goes by. Now, let's take the next step and apply these ideas to the sun. So even though the sun's apparent effective surface is not a solid surface, nevertheless we can pretend that we could build something like the Tower of Pisa on the surface of the sun and repeat our grapefruit experiment there. So if we were to do that, uh, we would find that one second after dropping the grapefruit, it would be moving downwards, falling towards the center of the sun with a speed of 30,000 centimeters per second. And then two seconds after we had dropped the object, it would be moving downwards with a speed of 60,000 centimeters per second. And three seconds after we dropped it, it would be moving down with a speed of 90,000 centimeters per second. So near the surface of the sun, a falling object would pick up an additional 30,000 centimeters per second of speed for each second of time that goes by. Or in other words, near the surface of the sun, a falling object would have an acceleration of 30,000 centimeters per second squared. And so that immediately tells us what the sun's surface gravity, g, is. That on for the sun, g is 30,000 centimeters per second squared. That's the sun's surface gravity. Now, thinking about the example of the sun, we can see that we're going to have the same sort of problem with surface gravity as we did with mass and radius uh, in episode 2. Namely, that for some stars at least, the values of surface gravity g are, go are going to be quite large numbers when expressed in centimeters per second squared. We're going to have numbers like 30,000 or so, uh, numbers that really need to be expressed with scientific notation. Uh, 30,000, the sun's surface gravity, is 3 times 10 to the fourth. 
Now in the case of surface gravity, the way astronomers deal with this problem of large numbers is by expressing the surface gravity by taking the logarithm to base 10 of the acceleration in centimeters per second squared. And so that gives you the object's log g value. So for the case of the Sun, the surface gravity g was 3 times 10 to the fourth centimeters squared, and so the Sun's log g value is 4.5. That 4.5 is the log base 10 of 30,000. If you take 10 and raise it to the power of 4.5, you will get back the Sun's surface gravity g of 30,000 centimeters per second squared. So just to get some more practice with using log g to express surface gravity, let's think about the example of the Earth. Remember that for the Earth, the surface gravity g was 1,000 centimeters per second. So Earth's log g value is 3. That the log of 1,000 is 3, or 10 to the power of 3 is 1,000. And by the way, it's worth noting that the strength of gravity at the surface of the Sun is 30 times larger than it is at the surface of the Earth. 30,000 centimeters per second squared versus 1,000 centimeters per second squared. The next thing for us to think about, um, as with the other properties we've talked about, is what's involved in measuring the surface gravity of a star. And here the news is very good. Astronomers have a way of reliably and routinely measuring the surface gravity of any star of interest, any single star. In fact, the situation with surface gravity is similar as it was with effective temperature. If you think back to the first video in this series, astronomers have a reliable way of measuring the effective temperature of any single star of interest just by doing photometry and measuring the color of that star, and the color indicates the surface temperature or effective temperature. Similarly, we have a reliable way of routinely uh, measuring the surface gravity of any single star of interest. Now that's by contrast with the properties that we talked about in episode 2, mass and radius. Remember those properties were much more difficult to measure. There we had to rely on finding stars that were in binary star systems. So I'm just going to tell you a little bit about how astronomers can measure uh, the surface gravity of stars. And it has to do with looking at this observation right here. So I've gone back to the Gray Star 3 uh, output panel here. And uh, what we have here is something that we have not talked about yet in this particular video series. Uh, this is a direct image of the star's visible light spectrum. So if we take the incoming light from a star and we pass it through a prism, or some other optical element that disperses light, that is, that takes each different component color of the star's light and sends it in a slightly different direction, then we can make an image like this one of the star's spectrum. And it is a universal feature of stellar spectra that we will find these narrow dark features. Let me zoom in on this just a little bit more. So these narrow dark features that appear in stellar spectra are known as dark lines or as spectral lines. Uh, these are places where a very particular color of light is not being emitted as brightly by the star. So we get a dark feature at that particular color. And astronomers, by studying the detailed shape of these dark spectral lines here, can measure the surface gravity of the star. And this is actually the reason why surface gravity is considered to be a fundamental stellar property. Uh, you may have been wondering why something as abstract as surface gravity would be considered a fundamental parameter for stars, and the reason is because surface gravity is something that can be directly measured for any star. So I'll tell you what the results are of measuring surface gravity among stars generally. 
that for objects that we would traditionally recognize as normal stars, the largest values of surface gravity that we measure, expressed as log g, have log g values of 5.5. Now let's think about what that means. Let's practice a little bit. Uh, that means that their surface gravity g in centimeters per second squared would be 10 raised to the power of 5.5. Now if we think about it, remember that the sun's log g value is 4.5. So 5.5 is just one power of 10 larger than the sun's log g value. Uh, and so for these stars of log g 5.5, their surface gravity, g, is 300,000 centimeters per second squared, or 10 times larger than the sun's value of g of 30,000 centimeters per second squared. Now, so for a star of log g equal to 5.5, its surface gravity is quite a bit bigger than the Earth's, 300 times bigger. At the other end of the range, among stars that are not too rare uh, and that are stable, the lowest values of log g that we measure are about 1.5. So again, that would mean for those stars that their surface gravity g is 10 to the power of 1.5. And if we think about it, that's three powers of 10 smaller than the sun's log g value of 4.5. So for these stars of log g equal to 1.5, their surface gravity g is 30 centimeters per second squared, or a thousand times smaller than the sun's value of 30,000. And also notice that for these stars of log g equal to 1.5, their surface gravity is quite a bit smaller than Earth's value of 1,000. In fact, about 30 times smaller. So, uh, just thinking about the overall range, um, a range in log g value from 5.5 down to 1.5 might not sound like a very big range, but you have to remember that those numbers are logs. That means that the range in the surface gravity g itself goes from about 300,000 centimeters per second squared down to 30 centimeters per second squared. So that's a pretty big range and it brackets the Earth's value. That there are stars out there whose surface gravity is much larger than that of Earth and other stars out there whose surface gravity is much smaller than that of Earth. There's an additional aspect to this that we should think about uh, at this point because it's going to affect what kinds of experiments we can do with gray star 3 in a few in a few minutes. And that has to do with the combination of surface gravity, the parameter that we're talking about here, and effective temperature, the parameter that we talked about in episode 1. Nature cannot make stable stars with just any old combination of effective temperature and surface gravity. Some combinations are unstable and stars with those unstable combinations cannot be simulated with gray star 3. The general rule is that the larger the value of the effective temperature of a star, the larger the value of the minimum surface gravity, log g, for which a star will be stable and can be simulated. So at the very low end of the effective temperature range that we talked about in episode 1, 3500 Kelvin or so, at that low and effective temperature we can have stable stars with surface gravity log g values as low as 1.5 and we can simulate stars like that with gray star 3. But if we go to warmer stars stars whose effective temperature is similar to that of the Sun, say 5800 or 6000 Kelvin or so, at those values of, of effective temperature, the smallest value of surface gravity log g that we can stably simulate is larger, it's 2.5. And so that's worth keeping in mind because it's going to play a role when we try to do experiments with gray star 3. So now we're ready to start doing some experiments with the Gray Star 3 Virtual Star Simulator. And uh, a minute ago we zoomed in on the spectrum there so that we could talk about it. Let me just zoom back out again. 
and go back up to the top. So uh, as always in this series of videos we only need to think about the first control panel here at the top, the one with the green background color. And for today's experiments we're going to be using the second knob in from the left, the one that's labeled surface gravity. In fact you can see that what uh, it's really labeled as being is log g, the logarithm of the surface gravity just like we talked about. And so that's what this quantity is here that is displayed. And then of course as always with Graystar 3 when we first load it, by default it is simulating the sun. And so uh, the value here that the log g knob should be set to is that for the sun and indeed it is. 4.5 is the solar value of the surface gravity expressed as log g. So we can now uh, grab a hold of that and just see what kind of input range Graystar 3 will allow. It will allow us to set surface gravities as large as 5.5 and as small as 1.5, uh, the range of measured values that we were talking about earlier. Okay, so I'm going to kind of give away the game here a little bit and just let you know before we do anything that what we're going to find is that when we adjust the surface gravity of a star and leave everything else as it is, uh, what will be affected is the star's radius. So knowing that that's what's going to happen, let's just do a little reality check here and uh, go on down to the output section and just make sure that the radius that we're currently getting makes sense that we're supposed to be simulating the sun right now and we can see the exact radius of the simulated star here in this output panel and it's about one solar radius, a little bit less uh, but that's close enough. We're simulating the sun by definition the radius of the simulation should be one solar radius uh, and it's very close to that right now. So we are in the right uh, default position here. Um, also, uh, thinking back to episode 2, the last episode, we saw there that if we were to change the stellar mass using this third knob here, that would also change the star's radius. So in the spirit of doing a controlled experiment, we only want to ever change one thing at a time, so we better make sure that we leave the mass alone so that we're only changing the surface gravity. So the mass is always going to be held to just one solar mass. Okay, so let's start by grabbing a hold of this thing here and turning the surface gravity up as high as it will go, 5.5, with the highest value that's been measured for normal stars. And I'll come down here, I'm going to zoom out here a little bit, okay, so as usual, uh, let's keep our eye on the direct image of the star that we're simulating down here while I hit the model button. So here we go. So we are now simulating a star whose surface gravity is 5.5. Uh, that's in the log. That's 10 times larger than the surface gravity of the Sun. And if you were watching the image, you may have noticed that the imaged, image jumped downward in size, that the radius of the star shrank when we turned up the surface gravity, leaving everything else as it was. Now we don't want to just eyeball that from the image. Uh, let's look at things more precisely uh, by looking at what's happened to the printed value of the radius and you can see that the radius of the simulation has gone down to a little bit less than 0.3, a little bit less than one-third of the Sun's radius. Okay, so when we turn off the surface gravity by a factor of 10 in G, uh, the radius gets smaller by a little more than a factor of 3. Now that doesn't sound a lot smaller, but let's, uh, drawing on lessons that we learned in episode 2, let's think about what that means for the star's volume. If the radius goes down by, let's say, a third, then of course the star's volume goes down by the cube of that. It goes down by a factor of 27. Okay, so this star has 1 27th of the volume uh, that the Sun had. Okay, now let's think about what that means for the average density of the star. It's the same mass, right? It's still one solar mass worth of material. We haven't changed that, but that one solar mass worth of material is now being compressed into 1 27th of the volume that we had before. So the average density of the star is going to be larger. It's going to be larger by about a factor of 27. 
So does this result make sense? Does it make sense that the star should be smaller when we turn up the surface gravity? Uh, and I think it does. A way that you can think about it uh, is that gravity is an attractive force. Gravity is a force that's making all the gas that comprises the star sort of try to fall towards the center. And we've just turned up the force of gravity. Um, and so this stronger gravitational force is going to compress the star's material into a smaller volume, that the same amount of material is being squeezed more tightly by a stronger force of gravity and is being compressed into a smaller, more compact volume with a higher density of gas. So I think that that makes sense. Okay, well now let's go in the other direction. So I'll go back up to the top here. And as usual, we want to be careful and start off by returning to the sun. So uh, a nice, safe and easy way to do that is just to hit reload. And uh, when Gray Star 3 comes back up, everything's returned to the solar inputs. And so we're back at a surface gravity of 4.5 again. Okay, and down here we're doing the sun again with a radius of about one solar radius. So this time, let's grab a hold of this thing and turn it down as far as it will go to a value. Well, actually, let me not do that. Let me turn it to a value of 2.5 for now. OK, so we've just turned it down to 2.5. And let's come down here and see what happens. Same deal as before. Keep your eye on the ball here. And I'll hit the model button. And you can see what's happened. Uh, if you were looking at the image of the star, you can see uh, that when we turn down the surface gravity in the log g from 4.5 to 2.5, the star got a lot bigger. The radius increased. Well, let's let's actually just think about what we did. From going going from a log g of 4.5 down to 2.5 means that we decreased the surface gravity g by a factor of 100. Okay, and you can see up here that the radius has gotten bigger by a factor of a little bit over 9. Uh, the radius of the simulation is now a little bit more than 9 solar radii. Okay, so again, let's think about what that means for the volume of the star. Uh, if the radius goes up by a factor of 9.3 compared to the sun, then the volume has gone up by a factor of about 800, okay, compared to the volume of the sun. So this is now a much larger star. Uh, and again, uh, the, surface, the mean density of the star is now much lower, that the same one solar mass worth of material is spread out now over a much larger volume, 800 times bigger than the volume of the sun. And again, that makes sense. We've turned down the surface gravity by a factor of 100 by going down 2 in the log g. Uh, and so the force of gravity squeezing this gas together is now much weaker, and so the star is less compressed. It can expand out more and occupy a larger volume, and so it has a larger radius. Okay, so I think this all uh, makes sense. Now let me just remind you of something we talked about in episode Two, that the number of pixels across the width of this image is being scaled as the log of the radius of the star and solar radii. Okay, and so that's why this image does not look nine times bigger than it did before. And uh, if you are wondering what that's about, then I encourage you to go back and look at episode two. Now we're trying to do experiments here where we investigate the effect of surface gravity on the other properties of a star. And so you may be wondering why I did not explore the full range of log g. Uh, if you remember when I set up the experiment that we did just now, um, I did not turn log g all the way down to 1.5, the smallest value that Gray Star 3 will allow. I just turned it down to log g 2.5. And you may be wondering why I did that. Let's go ahead and try to do that right now and see what happens. Let me turn this all the way down to 1.5, the smallest value Gray Star 3 will accept, and we'll see what happens. And uh, this is actually going to give us a chance to see another aspect of how Gray Star 3 works. So there we are, entering a log g value of 1.5. And let's come down here and uh, repeat the same procedure. Uh, keep your eye on the simulation down here, and I'll hit the model button. Here we go. And 
nothing happens. Uh, the simulation has just run and you can see that the size of the image did not change. And in fact, if we look up here at the printed value of the radius of the simulation, it did not change. It's still 9.3 solar radii, the same as it was before uh, when we put in log g equals 2.5. So what's happened here? Let's go back up to the top and uh, just check the input controls that we set. And if you look at the log G control here, you'll see something interesting has happened. That Graystar 3 has set the log G knob back to 2.5 for us. In other words, Graystar 3 has overridden our input of 1.5 and automatically increased it for us back to 2.5. Now what's happening here is that Graystar 3 automatically protects itself when the user inputs values that correspond to a star that's unstable. If Graystar 3 tries to simulate a star that's unstable, then the code will crash. And so it automatically protects itself from that situation. And you might remember a few minutes ago, earlier in the episode, we talked about how nature cannot make stable stars with just any old combination of effective temperature and, and surface gravity, log g. In fact, the higher the effective temperature, the larger the minimum value of log g you can have and still have a stable star. And at the effective temperature of the sun, which is what we've had here all along, 5800 Kelvin, it turns out 2.5 is about the lowest log g you can have and still have have a stable star that Graystar 3 can simulate. Now I'm just going to point out one more aspect here of how Graystar 3 works. If we come down here, something we haven't talked about yet is in this output panel here on the right, uh, Graystar 3 actually echoes back to the user the values of all the input parameters that it actually used in the simulation. Now most of these parameters we have not talked about and we will not talk about them in this video series so you can just ignore all this stuff over here. Uh, in this video series we've only been thinking about the first few parameters on the left here, effective temperature. Uh, today we've been talking about log g and so you can see that Graystar 3 is letting us know here that uh, the value of log g that it actually used in the simulation is 2.5, not the 1.5 that we tried to set. And you can also see that Graystar 3 is printing out uh, the value of log g in red. Okay, so that's Graystar 3's way of drawing to our attention that it, it, it has had to override one of our parameters. Okay, so when you're using Graystar 3, and this is important for any of you who are teachers or instructors, uh, if any of these input parameters get echoed back to you in red, that means that Graystar 3 has had to override your value and protect it with another one, uh, in or and replace it with another one in order to protect itself. So what this means is that if we want to explore the full range of log g, uh, then we need to turn down the effective temperature. So I'm going to come back up here to the top. Actually, just to be careful about this, let me hit reload so that we are setting all the parameters back to the default values for the sun. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start this time by taking the effective temperature and turning it all the way down to 3500 Kelvin, the lowest value we can go. In fact, let me um, type in the box here so that we can set that to exactly 3500 Kelvin, the lowest value that Graystar 3 will accept. Now I just want to make one change at a time, so let me leave the surface gravity alone here. It's back at the solar value of 4.5, and we'll come down here and hit the model button, and you can see what's happened. Uh, the radius hasn't changed, there's no reason why it would, because we did not change either the mass or the surface gravity. Uh, but the color changed. This takes us back to episode one when we were talking about the role of effective temperature and the relationship with color. So if you've seen episode one, what just happened uh, shouldn't surprise you that the star just turned from yellow to sort of orangey red. But now that we are at a lower effective temperature of 3500 Kelvin, Graystar 3 should now let us turn this all the way down, this surface gravity, all the way down to the lowest value, 1.5. And this time we should be okay. So let's go down here and uh, see what happens. We'll 
hit the model button, watch the simulation. And so now uh, we are simulating a star whose surface gravity log g is 1.5 and we can confirm that that's what's really happened this time in a couple of ways. We can go back up and check that the surface gravity knob still is at 1.5, the value that we set. And, or we could come down here to where Graystar 3 echoes back the parameters it actually used, and we can see that now log g really is 1.5. And that's being printed out now in black rather than red. Uh, that means that everything's okay. So, uh, let's have a look at the radius. When we turn the log g value all the way down to 1.5, we can see that the radius of the star is now almost 30 solar radii, almost 30 times uh, the size of the sun. So, now we finally know where the giant stars come from. That if we want to make giant stars whose radii is larger than 10 solar radii or so, the key is to turn the surface gravity down to low values, to values below 2.5 or 2 or so. Now we should think a little bit more about how large this star really is that we just made. Because remember, if its radius is 30 solar radii, then that means that its volume is actually 27,000 times the volume of the Sun. 30 times 30 is 900, times a third power of 30 is 27,000. So that's a huge star. Now, what's more, remember that in order to be able to turn the surface gravity down to 1.5, where we could get this large radius, uh, we had to turn the effect of temperature down first to 3500 Kelvin, and that made the color of the star very orangey reddish. And so for that reason, this object that we just made here is an example of what's known as a red giant. Now another way to make sure that we really understand how things work here uh, is if we go back up to the top here and look at the control panel, uh, you will notice that Graystar 3 does not have a radius knob. There is no input control that lets us directly set the radius of the star. And the reason for that is because a radius knob would be redundant and would just cause confusion that if we put together everything we talked about in the last video, episode 2, and what we've been talking about here, then we can see that a star's radius is completely determined by its surface gravity, log g, and by its mass. Okay, that those two things, the surface gravity and the mass, working together, completely determine the star's radius for us. And what's more, the surface gravity is the quantity that astronomers can routinely measure for any star of interest, whereas the radius is not. It's harder to measure the radius. And so that's why we choose to input surface gravity and mass and let the simulation determine for us what the corresponding radius is. Okay, so we also have an opportunity here to go back and to talk about something else important that I mentioned earlier, uh, namely the idea that astronomers can routinely measure the surface gravity of any star of interest by looking at the detailed shape of these dark features in the star's spectrum, these dark lines or spectral lines that we were talking about earlier. We're now in a position to actually demonstrate a little bit how that works. So to do that, let me go back up to the top here and I'm going to reset the surface gravity all the way back to its highest value, log g equals 5.5. I'm going to come down here and hit the model button so that we're back to modeling a very high surface gravity star and you can see that the radius of the star has collapsed back down again to about a third of a solar radius but if we come over here and look at the spectrum you can see what's happened. Let me zoom in here a little bit. So we're going to look at the spectrum this time of our simulation. And you can see that if we go to a large surface gravity of 5.5, these dark features, these spectral lines, become very broad. Okay, very wide. Now I'm going to go back up to the top and turn the surface gravity all the way down to its lowest value, 1.5. 
we'll come back down here. It's a little bit hard to find things at this zoom factor. Hit the model button. And if we go back and look at the spectrum and compare it to what we were just looking at, you can see that we still have the same dark spectral lines at the same colors, but now they are much narrower. So this is what I was talking about earlier uh, when I said that astronomers can use the detailed shape of these dark features in the spectrum to determine the surface gravity. That the rule is that the wider these individual dark lines in the spectrum, the larger the surface gravity. Now we're actually starting to sneak up on some pretty advanced astronomy here. Uh, what we're actually talking about here is an advanced technique called stellar spectroscopy, uh, where that word spectroscopy refers to the study of the star's spectrum. And uh, that's what we're really doing when we start to talk about something like using the width of these dark features in the star's spectrum to measure the star's surface gravity. So we're starting to get a, a little bit of a, a sneak preview here of some pretty advanced astronomy. In fact, this gives astronomers a pretty powerful tool if we put together everything that we've talked about in this episode and the last episode. Because now, if we think about everything that we have, um, an astronomer can measure the mass of a star if that star is in a binary star system. And remember, binary star systems are quite common. And to measure the mass, that binary system does not have to be an eclipsing binary star system. A wider variety of binary star systems, not necessarily eclipsing systems, can be used to measure stars' masses. What's more, by looking at the width of the dark lines in the star's spectrum, as we were just discussing, astronomers can determine the star's surface gravity. And then by combining those two pieces of information, the measured value of the star's mass and the measured value of its surface gravity, astronomers can calculate the star's radius. Okay, so this is important. This gives astronomers a second way to get at the radius of stars. Uh, and it can be used even if that star is not in, in an eclipsing binary. And that's useful because remember, eclipsing binaries are very rare. So as usual, I'm going to wind up by suggesting a pedagogical activity based on today's content uh, for teachers and instructors. And uh, the, what we were talking about today actually leads to quite uh, a fun and instructive activity that students could do. So if we go, go back to Gray Star 3 here, we'll zoom back out. Uh, we've seen today that both the surface gravity that we input and the mass that we input will both affect a star's radius. So something that you could challenge the students to do would be to see if they can find different combinations of surface gravity, log g, and mass that lead to the same value of the star's radius. Um, and they could find that out by doing simulations with gray star 3. So let me show you an example of what I mean. Uh, let me uh, turn the mass to one solar mass. In fact, it already is at one solar mass. So let me leave it there. That's the mass of the sun. And I'm going to take the surface gravity here and set it to a value of 3.8, a little bit less than the sun's surface gravity. And let's come down here and hit the model button. And you can see that at that combination of mass and surface gravity, we get a star whose radius is about two solar radii, give or take a little bit. We just round off here to the first decimal place. That's about two solar radii. Now, let me come back up to the top here. And I'm going to take the mass and I'm going to turn it all the way up as high as it will go and model a fairly massive star, five solar masses. But at the same time, I'm going to take the surface gravity knob and I'm going to turn it up uh, back to a value uh, equal to the sun's surface gravity, 4.5. So that's a different combination. I've changed both log g and mass at the same time. And uh, we'll come down here and hit the model button and see what happens. 
And we've just simulated a star with a new combination. We could uh, confirm that by looking at the parameters over here that have been echoed back to us. Log g is now 4.5, mass is m. And you can see that the radius that we're getting is exactly the same as it was before, about two solar radii. Okay, so there's two different combinations of mass and surface gravity that both give you a star of the same radius. Okay, now uh, what's happened here, um, if you think back to episode two, uh, by turning the mass up from one to five, that by itself wants to make the star bigger give it a larger radius. That's what we saw in episode two. But at the same time, I turned the surface gravity up from 3.8 to 4.5. And that by itself wants to squeeze the star tighter and give it a smaller radius. So those two effects canceled each other out exactly and conspired uh, to give me a star of the same radius. Okay, so that's sort of a fun activity that the class could do together or that students could work on in small groups is just to see if they can see how many different combinations they can find of surface gravity and mass that keeps giving them back a star of the same radius. Now at a more advanced level, let's say we're at the high school grade 12 level first year university, uh, we could take this and make it a little bit more interesting. Uh, what you could have st students do is pick a target radius. So for example, uh, two solar radii, the value that we are working with here, for example. So that's the target radius. That's the radius that we're always going to try to make the simulation have each time we do a model run. Uh, and then keeping that target radius in mind, what you could have the students do is set the value of the input mass to a whole set of different values that are uniformly spaced and that sample the whole range of input mass here. And for each of those values of input mass, see if the students can find the value of the surface gravity log g that will cause the simulation to hit the target radius that you've picked, say two solar radii. So students would have to do that by trial and error experimentation, right? That for a given input mass, uh, the surface gravity that they try first might give them a radius for the computed simulation that's too large, in which case they would turn the surface gravity up to make the simulation smaller, or they might pick a value of log g that makes the simulation too small in radius, in which case they would have to turn log g up or down, I guess. But through a, a series of trial and error experimentation, you could have students try to find for each input mass which value of log g uh, returns a simulation that has the target radius, say to the first decimal place. Getting it to the second decimal place is a little tough and, and unnecessary. Say to the first decimal place. And if they can do that for a bunch of different masses, then that will give them a data set where that data set consists of data points that are made up of an input mass value and the log g surface gravity value that gave them the right target radius. Uh, and they could use that data set to make a plot, a graph of log g surface gravity versus input mass for constant radius. So what they would be getting there are lines of constant radius uh, in a plot of surface gravity versus mass. Then you could have them do that for several different values of the target radius. So they do it for a target radius of two solar radii, then maybe they do it again at one solar radius and again at three or four solar radii or half a solar radius or something. And they could generate a family of lines of constant radius uh, in a graph of log g surface gravity versus input stellar mass. In the next video, in episode four, uh, we're going to talk about a fifth and final basic stellar property of stars, namely a star's brightness, something we haven't said too much about yet. And that will be the final basic property that we're going to discuss. And then in episode five, we're going to put everything together and tie a ribbon around it uh, and to make one of the most important diagrams in stellar astronomy. So come back for episode four, uh, where we will talk about brightness. Now, as always, I'll just conclude here by reminding everybody of the main Graystar 3 site. So I'll go up to the URL here and just go up one level. 
So there's the main Graystar 3 page, and I'll remind you of the resources that are there, uh, that there is a blog for teachers and users who want to share ideas for lesson plans or for lab projects, or you can even use that to make suggestions for improvements that you would like to see to Graystar 3. And as always, I'll remind everybody that uh, if you and your students don't want to rely on a connection to a remote server, then you can download your own local installation of Graystar 3 by clicking on this link here that I'm highlighting in red. Um, and if you are not sure what to do with a tarball, you can have your local IT professional help you. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time for Episode 4.